In this video, we're going to look at detrital or clastic sedimentary rocks. In the image here, you see a great example of one of those. This is a really famous location called The Wave. It's right on the Arizona-Utah border, pretty close to Page. This is a beautiful example of a cross-bedded sandstone. So to make a clastic sedimentary rock, there's a number of steps that have to happen first. So step number one, weathering, or weathering breaks down the rocks. We need those pieces to make up the rock. You can see this lovely granite boulder breaking apart into smaller pieces. Step number two, erosion removes the broken rocks or sediment from its location. So this is what actually picks up those broken pieces. Um, a lot of times this is due thanks to water, but there are other processes that happen too. But you can see in the image here, this river is eroding along the bank and picking up that sediment. Step number three, transportation moves the sediment by gravity, ice, wind, or water. The size of the sediment carried depends on the speed of the moving wind or water. The faster it goes, the bigger the pieces it can carry, although thank goodness wind doesn't carry very big pieces at all. Um, ice and gravity can carry any darn size they want though. Step number four is deposition. Deposition occurs when the sediment settles out. This is often due to the wind or water slowing down. So you can see this image, I believe, was from Utah. The, there was a flood, but now that flood water is receded, slowed down, and left behind mud and boulders too. Step number five is lithification. Remember, lith means rock. So this is when the sediment actually becomes rock. So we're actually transforming the class into a sedimentary rock. All right, so those are the steps. Let's look at some examples of these things. I want to make sure and clear up one quick little uh, language thing. So a vocabulary word for you. A clast. A clast is the pieces of the rock inside of another rock. So for instance, in this picture, there's a clast right here that's red and white striped. There's a class right here that looks almost kind of blue. There's a white class. There's a brown and white striped class. Looks like there's kind of a dark black and white stripes. So each one of those is the class. And we're going to classify our detrital or clastic sedimentary rocks based on the size of the clasts that are in the rock or the shape. Those are the two things we're going to be looking at. All right, so we're going to. Um, so, for the size of the class, these are the size classifications. Um, we give them the range in millimeters. So, how big is 1 16th of a millimeter? Yeah, I don't know either, I'll be honest. So, I have kind of an easy way for you to remember these things. All right, we're going to break everything into just three class sizes. It'll make your life easier that way. All right. So, at the very bottom, silts and clays. This is the stuff you can't see, and that's the easy way to remember it. All right, there are ways to tell which one this is, even though you can't see them in the field. Um, so what a geologist will do was, is actually bite off a tiny piece of the rock or grind it between your teeth. When you grind it between your teeth, clay-sized particles are teeny, teeny, tiny, and they feel gooey or gummy. The sill-sized particles are a little bit bigger. They actually feel gritty in between your teeth, and that's how you tell those apart. Um, I won't make you do it unless I'm feeling really mean that day. Sand size particles are pretty easy. Everybody sort of knows what sand is like, so I'll leave that. Granules and pebbles are the size of aquarium gravel, like the stuff you buy to put in the bottom for your fish. Cobbles are potato sized. And boulders are anything bigger than your head. All right, but for our purposes today, we're gonna have the itty bitty stuff, the sand size stuff, and the big stuff. Those are your three choices. So if we start at the very bottom of our scale here with mud rock. So mud rock is the very smallest stuff. It includes siltstone, claystone, mudstone, shale. The key to this is these form in environments where the water is really still. And that's because these are really fine sediments. They make water really muddy. And for that mud to be able to settle out and deposit, that water has to be very still or very slightly moving. 
So what are some environments that have really quiet water or water that doesn't have just a whole lot of a current? Well, things like lakes, things like river floodplains this is actually a really common one. So the floodplain is this area out here. So when the water gets deep, and the water spreads out of its normal banks. You get lots of mud deposited out in these areas. Or a river delta, because by the time your rivers get down to the delta, they're moving very, very slowly. So these are really common places to deposit really fine silt and clay-sized sediment. And those are going to lithify into a mud rock. Looks like this. They're kind of boring. Um, like I said, you're not going to be built able to actually see any particles and, and or really feel them either. Now sometimes these are layered. So if it breaks into really thin layers, we call this shale, and that's a term called fissile. All right, a little bit bigger pieces, we have sandstone. All right, sandstone is going to be where you have nice moving wind and water. Pretty much any time that wind or water moves, it's able to pick up sand fairly easily. So where are some examples where you have sand that piles up? How about a beach? Sandy beaches are great places to form sandstones. Or some riverbeds will actually carry, carry sand-sized pieces. We'll see rivers quite a bit here. Or sand dunes in your deserts, these big, lovely, sweeping sand dunes. This right here is a look into how the rocks at the wave that we started with actually formed. All right, now that the sand size pieces are big enough for us to see, we can actually look at them a little bit closer. So we can actually see those little pieces. All right, so we can start kind of thinking about some, what those class look like. So for instance, we can look at the sorting. So sediment that is all one size is said to be very well sorted. This is usually indicative of a really, uh, a current that doesn't change much. So lots of wind, some water. It all moves at about the same speed. But sediment that has a large range of class size, over here, like this one over here, there's some big pieces, there's some little pieces, there's some itty bitty pieces. This is very poorly sorted. Um, a lot of times this is stuff that hasn't been transported very, very far, or it's something that moves a lot pretty quickly and you don't have time to really sift out the different sizes. So in this picture, which one is the most well sorted? Hopefully you saw this one and you can see the little ripples on the surface. It tells us it's actually wind blowing and that wind is always going to pick up the same si kind of size. Over here, this is very poorly sorted. There's a rock hammer for scale. So you can see there's a boulder sized piece and there's stuff in the middle that is probably like mud and clay size. And then we have this, the poorly sorted. Most of these look like they are pebble to kind of a coarse sand. We can also look at the shape of the clast. The angularity is the degree to which clast have smooth surfaces. So the more round it is, the less angular it is. You can also look at sphericity, how round it acts, the closer it is to the sphere shape. No, so let's look at these pictures. Which one has class that are better rounded? Ooh, sorry. Hopefully you saw this one on their right is a little more rounded. Um, these are all these are all quartz grains. Even this orange one, this is actually covered in hematite. That's a chunk of hematite right there. So notice we've got lots of quartz and just a little bit of hematite. That's going to come back to us when we talk about lithification processes. So keep that in mind. So rounding, size, and sorting all depends on the distance from the sediment source and how fast the water moves. The faster it moves, the bigger the pieces are. But the further it goes, the rounder it gets, and the more you're going to actually get smaller and smaller pieces. So we look at the mountains versus the river versus the plains. You get big angular pieces with lots of stuff mixed in at the front top. The river, we get smaller and smaller pieces. And finally, when we get on the plain where the water doesn't move very fast at all, you get your silts and clays. 
We can also look at the composition of sandstone. We can recognize the minerals that make it up at this point. For instance, these dunes right here are made of, a, would, would create a sandstone that looks like this. And if you look, that is all the exact same mineral. Can you tell what mineral that is? Well, hopefully you said quartz. Because a sandstone that's made of all quartz is called an aronite. Um, and this is because everything else, all the other minerals weathered away out of your sediment. And all that was left was that quartz that doesn't weather very, very easily. So these tend to be really, we call these a mature sandstone. What about this rock? What color is this? So hopefully you recognize it's got that kind of pink color. What mineral does that look like? Maybe some potassium feldspar. This is a, a sandstone called Arcos. And Arcos has lots of potassium feldspar. You also tend to get really angular pieces in there. So notice you can see corners on that one. The Arcos form where you have um, very little movement or very short transportation distances. And here's your host here, these granite boulders. Notice how round it is. That ought to tell you it's granite because it's spheroidal, right? When granite weathers, it tends to form arcos. But when granite weathers, it also forms aronite. So what's if it's granite weathering to form arcos and aronite, why, why are they different? I'm going to leave that one for you to think about. All right, our last class size here is the big stuff. And in this case, the shape of the class are actually really, really important. And it's all about how rounded they are. All right, so on the left, lovely rounded pieces. On the right, very angular ones. So what that means is those rounded pieces form the rock conglomerate. A rock with the same size class, but angular class, is called breccia. The way I try to remember this one is conglomerate has O's in it. O's are round just like the class star, if that helps you out. So what's an environment where I could found, find lots of round pebbles? And what's an environment where I can find lots of angular pebbles? Well, what about a river? A nice swift moving river because it's got to be swift enough to pick up those class and roll them along the bed so that they can round just like a rock tumbler does. On the right, this is a landslide. So everything moves and then stops. So things don't really get rounded off very well. Um, and you can see lots of angular pieces of all sorts of different sizes.